You're listening to the Mind Over Murder podcast. My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the unsolved Colonial Parkway murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook group, together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Welcome to Mind Over Murder. I'm Kristen Dilley. And I'm Bill Thomas. We're joined today by Colleen Fitzpatrick, a pioneer in the field of forensic genetic genealogy and rocket scientist. One of our favorite people to talk to. Colleen, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. We wanted to talk to you about a couple of pretty interesting things that have come across the radar recently in the field of investigative genetic genealogy. So we want to talk to you specifically today about Summerton Man. Yeah, this was a great case. Yeah, it's my favorite so far. I have all my cases are favorites, but I like this one the best. Give us a little bit of information about the Summerton Man case. The Summerton Man case was the most well-known case in Australia, the well-known, most well-known cold case in Australia. It was a man who was found dead on a beach in Adelaide, near Adelaide in 1948. He had no tags in his clothes. He had apparently died, uh, the autopsy said by poison, but no poison could be found in his system. So this became a mystery because nobody knew who he was. And I guess Adelaide's not that big a town. So they put it, the news in the paper and so on. Nobody identified him. And then they, the first thing that happened was they found his suitcase in the Adelaide train station. He had checked it. Then he had taken, I think, taken the trolley. I think he had, a, he had bought a bus ticket, but he took the trolley to the beach. And then he wound up dying on the beach. He's sitting there fully clothed with his back against the seawall, dead. He didn't wash up on the shore or anything like that. The fact that he's at the beach, he wasn't in the water or anything like that as far as they know. He appears to be not have died of natural causes, but to have committed suicide, but they don't know how? Well, no, it was indeterminate. He was wearing a suit and a tie. His shoes were clean. They weren't. It wasn't like he was walking in the mud or the soil, the wet sand. He, uh, yeah, he, they couldn't, they thought he was poisoned. They thought he had eaten a pasty earlier in the day was for something. And he, his, some of his organs were gorged with blood, which is an indication of poison, but they could not find any poison in his system. So there was, and they couldn't say he was poisoned. They couldn't say he wasn't poisoned. He could have died of natural causes. They, it was so indeterminate. And the inquests, whatever the coroner did, led nowhere. The media led nowhere. The contents of the suitcase led nowhere. There were, the tags were taken out the clothes in the suitcase. He had ties, he had a bathrobe, he had shirts, you know, what you'd think you'd pack for a few days away, and a few tools, postcards, a few pencils, nothing really that jumped out at you. And they had actually one of the clues that, one of the few clues at that time was that three articles in the suitcase, there was, I think, a, like a duffel or a clothing bag, a t-shirt which was called a singlet and a tie. And they were marked in India ink with the name Keen, K-E-A-N-E or K-E-A-N. And the first initial was either T or J. Immediately, this being one of the only clues, authorities were looking for Mr. Keen and it went nowhere too. The man was buried. And so it takes a strange turn at that point. When the man was buried, they did a couple of things happen. They made a plaster cast of the upper torso of his body. And that was to keep some kind of record. They took autopsy photographs, but then they did this plaster cast. And they also eventually, about that time, they buried him and they were putting his clothes away as evidence. And they found a small fob pocket, like a watch pocket, that they had not noticed. This is where 
the story takes kind of a bizarre turn <laughs> because there was a small piece of paper in the pocket and it had two words on it and it's Tom and should. And at first nobody really knew what that meant, but in, in, in talking to people in the area, there was a journalist who knew what it was and it was the last two words of a love poem called the Rubaiyat by Omar Khayyam. Mm. I think he was an 11th century Persian poet or something. The phrase, a loaf of bread, a jug of wine, and thou, and that all, a lot of that comes from the room. Okay. And it turns out that those two words mean it's finished or the end. Ooh, As a great clue. The end of a romance. It's a love poem, like, but it leads to the end. Yeah, no, the whole poem is a whole book. It's not just one poem. It goes on and it talks about the fleeting nature of life and how the moving finger writes and having writ moves on and not your, what any of your tears will erase a word of it. It's the transience of life. And it's a very beautiful kind of ode to living in life and live life to the fullest. And life is beautiful and love is beautiful. And it goes on, and then the last two words are Tom and should, meaning the end. Wow. Uh, would, would thou and I with fate conspire to understand the scheme of things, sorry schemes of life entire, mm. and shattering it to bits, remold it near the heart's desire? And it goes on about life and death. And if you come through the garden to find me, I won't be here anymore. And look for me in the grass. Yeah, it's a very beautiful poem. It's sad, though, on some level, particularly well, it, when you think about the, those two words just being tucked in this little piece of paper. Yeah, you know, it adds to why a man dead on the beach, and he's got the words, the end, in 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 part of the rubai you can't make this stuff up this is no. a beautiful love no, story no. for netflix at one point it's, they find okay so this piece of paper starts to go in the newspaper and it's another hand clue everybody's talking about this and then a man comes forward or it's unclear whether it was one person or two guys and they just say two guys came forward and they said we parked our car near the beach the night the man died and we came to get it the next morning and when we did we found a copy of the rubaiyat on the back seat that was left there and by someone i else. thought he owned it he owned thought i owned it we mm -hmm. put it in the glove compartment wow however <laughs> when we read your newspaper article yes we opened the back and guess what the last two words have been torn out okay they have the book and in the back of the book, there was a phone number. It goes on forever. <laughs> this is great. You've got to work the clues you have. Yeah, the and the phone number. Okay, the phone number. First, they have two things. They have a code. The code, just a bunch of letters and four lines of letters of some kind. And then they have the phone number. The code is a basis for the rumor that develops that he's a Russian spy. Okay, now that develops. Let's hold that in reserve for a few minutes. Right. Okay. Just to remind everybody, this is 1948, so this is a few years after the end of World War II, and this is in Australia. So the conflict between the Russians and the Western powers, if you will, is now building now that World War II is over. This idea that this man is a Russian spy is one of the things that starts to develop over time. That is correct. And in fact, there was a top secret, I think, weapon station built really near Adelaide in Australia at that time. Mm. Now, I don't think everybody knew that, but certainly eventually it got out and, or some people were hired to work there. And some people knew about it and that probably didn't hurt the story about the man being a spy. And so you were talking then about a phone number is found in the book and law enforcement Correct. begins to look into who owns this phone number. Yes. Do you want to know who owned the phone number? Is that yes? It? We're oh, should we end it here? <laughs> oh no, who owns the phone number? We want to yeah. know. No, we don't phone get to number. say. Tune in next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tune in next week, and you can find out who owns the phone number. <laughs>
Follow us on Patreon and you can. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yes, yeah, some of our podcast uh, friends have higher level uh, subscriptions. We haven't gone down that road. <laughs> oh, let's do that then. Let them pay me. You run the balls of phone right. number. The mystery will well, be solved. Okay. I'll let the cat out the bag here. The phone number belongs to a nurse who lives a few hundred yards from the beach. Oh, the plot thickens. All right. So. It's not known who her name was till much later. I'll tell you her name. Her name was Joe Thompson, but she was in those days, they didn't interrogate people very thoroughly. So they didn't release her name. We, we were in a different era and they were softballing her. So they go over to her apartment and they say, and it's not really clear what happens. It's, do you know about the Rubaiyat? And they weren't sure whether, it's unclear whether they were asking, do you know what that is? Or... Do you know the Rubaiyat I'm holding in my hand that we found in the back of the car? And she said, I did give a copy of the Rubaiyat to a friend of mine a couple of years ago when I was studying nursing in Sydney. What would you do at that point? (laughs) I'd want to know who the friend was. Who's the friend? Yeah. The friend is alive and well and living outside of Sydney. Uh, And he still has his copy. So he's he's not the guy. So he's not the guy. No, No. And so... Now, it's murky what happens because they she does go down to the police station. She does look at this plaster cast. And by various accounts, she passes out. And right. There's one version. Right. Another version is she doesn't act quite right. You know, so it's like varying degrees of discomfort there. All right. Now, Justin is her pen, pen name in when she signs the other book, Justin, to her friend. So she's basically known as Justin for many years. Okay. So Justin, let's go down and find out who Justin is. She's Her name is Joe Thompson. He has an 18-month-old son named Robin. You get it. Okay. Now, Justin, it, in the end, she says, I'm a nurse. My name is Joe Thompson. She was not actually married yet to her future husband, Prosper, because he was trying to divorce his wife to marry Justin. And she had not completed her nursing yet, but she represented, she's Joe Thompson. She's a nurse and she has an 18 month old son named Robin. Okay, so let's talk, let's find out what happened to Robin. Now, Derek Abbott is a professor at Adelaide University. And he became interested in this story about 10 years ago. And he find, found out, tried to find out what happened to Justin, if she was still around to interview her. He tried to find Robin. And Justin had died a couple of years earlier, but Robin had only died a few months earlier. So he missed talking to Robin by a gnat's eyebrow. Wow. But he was persistent. And he, let's see, so some of the things, he used sort of modern forensics to do a little bit of investigation. The Somerton man was athletic. He was in good shape, aside from the fact his organs were gorged with blood. Let's sorry about that. But he otherwise his legs were very muscular. He was in good shape. Let's talk about Robin for a minute. Robin became a world class ballet dancer. Oh wow. He died. He danced with the Royal Australian Ballet in a corps de ballet. So Robin also had a kind of unusual feature in that he was missing his lateral incisors. So you have your center teeth, Mm -hmm. incisors, you have the two teeth next to those, and then you have the rest of your teeth. And some people have a condition called hypodontia, and that means either born with not enough teeth or too many teeth. No, wait, no, it's normal. Freddie Mercury had two extra sets of molars, and that's part why he could sing. The acoustics of his mouth were unusual. Wow. And he had a chance to get them removed, but he didn't want to do it because he was afraid the architecture would change and he couldn't sing like he did. I had no Um, idea. Bill, did you know that? I did. And then if you look at pictures of Freddie Mercury, he has a peculiar overbite, which he was a bit self-conscious about like Barbara Streisand, who was advised years before, Oh, you'd be so much more beautiful. If you got a nose job, she didn't want to change characteristics of her nose 
for fear that it would damage her incredibly beautiful voice. And Freddie Mercury felt the same way about changing the characteristics of his mouth because the guy did have a spectacular voice. And if I was him, I wouldn't have done anything either because that cat could sing. I had no idea. That's really cool. All yeah. right. I learned something. I learned multiple new things today, but that one's pretty excellent. So you get to hear the, about Barbara you, Streisand. That's pretty interesting. But yeah. You're right. You're right. In this case, Summerton Man has fewer teeth than the average bear. Both Robin and the Summerton Man are missing their lateral incisors. Mm, oh. Interesting. Okay. And it's just natural. It, they didn't yeah. fall out. They just never were there. Born that way. Yeah, they were born that way. Tom Cruise has the same thing. He's missing one of them. So watch a picture of him smile. You're going to see he's missing one tooth on one side. And I think he actually got it fixed later when he became a big movie star. But if you look in the early days, back when he was Tom Mepother as a young actor, he doesn't I don't know if that's possible because you'd have to move all your teeth. You'd have to wear braces to make room for that. Yeah, he did definitely change his teeth after he had some success. Interestingly then, Robin shares this characteristic with the Summerton man. And the well-developed calves and everything. Yeah, and he also has an unusual ear formation I think the big part of your ear is at the bottom and the small earlobe. He's got that reverse, just like Robin does. Very interesting. Do yeah, these I don't are see where of, this is headed, right? Yeah, yeah. These are unique physical characteristics. Okay. You would like to go down the rabbit hole now about Robin. Sure. Yes. Why not? Yes. Why not? This is the story, the gift that goes on giving. Huh? I hope you have the rest of the week to finish this podcast. <laughs> Here's what happened to Robin. Robin becomes a real world-class ballet dancer. He's good. And Derek goes around trying to interview these key characters in the story and finds out Justin has gone and Robin has just died. However, again, Robin has a daughter. He has a daughter with another ballet dancer called Roma. They never get married, but they have this daughter. Roma and Robin have Rachel. (laughs) It's just... (laughs) All these okay. Names. <laughs> All right. So, of course, Derek catches up with Rachel and gives, she gives the interview about who, whatever she can say. And they actually hit it off and they wind up getting married. Oh, my God. I thought this was such a crazy <laughs> twist here. She marries Professor Abbott, Derek Abbott, the University of Adelaide professor who's looking into her father's potential origins. Yeah, so he could be the grandson-in-law of the Summerton man. Wow. And you can't make this stuff up. If we no. were writing a novel, man. we would probably this all this stuff. Really? Okay, and they have children. So now right. his children could be the potential great-grandchildren of the Summerton You're listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll be right back after this word from our sponsors. We're back here at Mind Over Murder. When DNA starts kicking in a few years ago, okay, Robin's dead. Now, Derek has an infinite source of Robin's DNA through his daughter and through his mother-in-law, okay? He takes his daughter, his wife's DNA, Robin's daughter, Rachel, and he takes her mother's DNA and he backs out what Robin's DNA has to be. So you follow all that. He now has Robin's DNA. Yes. He notices that he does autosomal snip testing, whatever, and he finds out that Robin, let's see, Robin's DNA has certain American characteristics in it. It's got a little swipe of Native American, and some of the segments are in common with the descendants of Thomas Jefferson. Wow. They have a big Jefferson DNA study, and he finds out, and they have all the Jefferson descendants have certain segments, certain DNA in common because they all come from that same family, and Robin has some of those. So now Robin might be American, part American. We know Robin's mother, Justin, is not. We know all that, but we don't know who Robin's father is. All right. Wow. Now, and some of the stuff in the suitcase was American, and they had five, like four or five ties in the suitcase. I think he was wearing one, and he had four others. And American ties go in one direction with the diagonal, and British ties go in the other direction. And he had both. 
Wow. Interesting. Okay. So, all right. So now Justin was the subject of mystery. Now Robin becomes the subject of mystery. About two years ago, one of our genealogists offered to do an adoption search based on Robin's DNA. You can do that. If you're an adoptee, give your DNA. We'll figure out who your parents are. We knew that, okay, we knew Justin. We already knew her. So we essentially had Robin's DNA, and we did an adoption search to find out who his father was, hoping on the edge of our chair we would crack the mystery wide open and be world famous, and they'd have ticker tape parades in New York (laughs) City for us. We'd be fabulously wealthy, flying over the world in our private jets. And (laughs) alas, it was not to be. Because, drumroll, Robin's father was Prosper Thompson. Oh, the fiancé, the later (laughs) husband. The fiancé who was divorcing his wife to marry Joe Thompson. There was some overlap. We stumbled on a little... We stumble on like a 70-year-old Peyton place. (laughs) Yeah, a little overlap between his relationship with his ex-wife and his soon-to-be wife. Soon-to-be wife. Wow. These things happen. It can happen. It can happen. All right, but we didn't, I don't know if we really ever said anything about that, but secretly we knew that in spite of all of these coincidences, nope. Although you did just say it on Mind Over Murder, so... There you have it. Well, it's not a secret anymore. Yes, okay. you, you can be the first one. I'll share the private jet with you someday. Okay. <laughs> but it was funny because along the way, we're looking through the suitcase. Derek asked me for help with this. I met Derek in 2015. I was down in Adelaide and we hit it off. He's a very nice fella. And we looked through, he told me about the suitcase. We looked through all the things. He asked me to look up whether they were American items. A lot of them were. Wrigley Spearmint Gum, mm-hmm. and Gum, home, some things. And where was I going with that? He, oh yeah, we didn't really release that. But one of the, one of the real red herrings that is very interesting is that at some point, Robin's middle name was McMahon. And we started wondering about where McMahon came from. Was that the Summerton man's real name? McMahon, was he named secretly after his dad? We found a family of McMahons in the UK that ran a ballet school. And they were like a farm team for the Royal Ballet. So you'd go to the school and they'd pump you up and prep you. And then you could audition for the Royal Ballet. And they got a lot of their students into the Royal Ballet. And they were missing their lateral incisors. Darn. So we're checking some boxes wow. here and it was a coincidence we had them dna tested and but see thankfully the the science that you brought to the table in terms of this investigation and exploration of the background now you're able to pin things down scientifically in terms of actual dna relationships which obviously they didn't have back in 1948 or at any point until the much more recent past I agree. I don't know how investigations like this could have gone on before the era of DNA. I can see all kinds of mistakes. So you, even starting at the Salem witch trials, let's face it, I, where just people said, hey, the guy's guilty. He was wearing a red shirt and I saw somebody standing on the corner wearing a red shirt. I know that's the murderer. You mm-hmm. wonder Hang on. how we survived. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And of course, the Salem witch trials are one of Kristen's favorites. She's yeah been up to Salem to check that stuff out. Oh, really? Yeah. We'll have to talk about that because I actually have some really interesting information about that. Oh, I'd love to hear about that. That yeah. sounds yeah. great. About how the weather may have caused the hallucinations, but oh, we'll talk the, about that. The moldy crops? The earth, the okay, yeah. Um, I actually, I've heard the ergot theory before. I think it's great and very compelling. Yeah. All right, we'll set yeah, up well, another I have, episode I have for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, we'll do that. We'll do that off air sometime. That sounds great. That'll be another like cul-de-sac we'll discuss later. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. That sounds great. Okay. At this point, then, you're doing traditional investigative work, checking things out, the objects in the suitcase and so on, but you're also pinning down the DNA and familial relationships between these players and potential players like the McMahon with the, yeah. with the court of ballet in the, the United Kingdom. And some things don't pan out. So that ends up being a dead end in terms of father relationship for Robin. Yeah. So Robin is not connected at all. It was Joe Thompson 
everybody just speculated and we're talking about you speculation. What does that mean? You don't have any proof. <laughs> who, and she's not ratting out Prosper because he's getting a divorce and heaven knows what his wife would do to him. She knew that the backstory. And this kind of goes on. And so anyway, fast forward between the 50s, here you have a woman with a baby that might be his and he might be a spy and he may have been poisoned, but nobody knows any poison and all the tickets are taken out of the clothes. The name Keen doesn't pan out. People come forward with other people who have died with the Rubaiyat by their side or pictures of ID cards with, hey, this looks just like the guy. Or, hey, I saw somebody really strange hanging around two weeks before and it looks just like him. All that stuff. And that's brought us to last year. So what happened last year? All these years, the Attorney General of South Australia refused to allow the man to be exhumed. He said, this is only for fun, for curiosity, entertainment, mm -hmm. whatever. No compelling reason to do this. Let him sleep in peace. Who cares? And there was always the argument that he, he has a family looking for him. Really, there is a humanitarian reason for exhuming him and doing DNA testing. And they were saying, no, whatever. And then Mr. Ra went out of office and the new attorney general came in. It's a woman. I forget her name. And she said, hey, it's fine. Okay. Yeah, you can exhume him. And plans were developed to exhume him. And it was done kind of very tight security. The police were out there. There's pictures on the internet, people, drones having a look and stuff like that. And the results, whatever they got were secret and nobody was talking about them. And we were thinking, gosh, we, I would to be part of that. And I may have been had it continued on that same course. But I have to say, however, three, you, you go back to the plaster cast that mm -hmm. was made. When they took the plaster cast and removed it, they caught some of the man's hair mm. in the plaster. Ah, okay. About 10 years ago, Derek was allowed access to that plaster cast, and they allowed him to remove some of the hair. When he removed it, he actually had, I would like to say, a hair removal specialist with him. It was a graduate student that it was bundles of hair that were pulled out. And she carefully took the hair in the middle of the bundle so it wasn't exposed okay. to the chemistry of the plastic. He had done some isotope analysis on the hair. He had done, he had tried, to, he got the mitochondrial haplogroup. He had done some things on it. Last fall, we discussed that he had this hair. And now one of the technical advancements is you can get DNA nuclear DNA out of rootless hair. We were trying to preserve the hair with the roots because until a few years ago, you needed the roots to get the nuclear DNA. But now there are places, companies, research institutes that can d get DNA out of hair shafts. This is obviously of great interest to us in the yeah. Colonial Parkway murders because my sister Kathy had hair in her hand at autopsy. Uh, there you go, Bill. I'm, there you go if you can get the FBI to test the hair appropriately. Mm -hmm. And that's where we find ourselves at this moment. Please continue. So there are <laughs> top labs who are now yeah. able to extract nuclear DNA that is a searchable DNA profile from the shaft of the hair, not necessarily yeah. the root material. Okay, now let me say it takes a little bit of art to do that, a little bit of science. The reason nobody knew that for a long time my understanding is that the DNA in the hair is actually fragmented and you have small fragments. And my understanding was that you can get mitochondrial DNA from the hair, the female DNA, but it's bigger pieces. So in developing the protocols to obtain the mitochondria, the, the smaller pieces escaped or escaped notice, something like that. Now that's a layman's explanation People just didn't know to look for smaller fragments. I think that's what happened. So the smaller fragments need to be stitched together appropriately to make the kind of file and the data we need to use. There are two kinds of markers. There's STR short chain and repeats, which are like pieces of DNA, real estate pieces. And there's SNPs, which are just points. Okay. So the chance of getting STR, the real estate, the pieces of DNA out of those fragments is still an area of research. Okay. There are people working on that, but SNPs are points. 
So even if you have a little teeny piece of DNA, there's going to be a point of DNA sitting on that. So SNPs are, not only can you get DNA from the hair, now you we do SNPs. We do autosomal SNPs like Ancestry23. They all use this point system. And that's in the last few years. So the technology had arrived not only to get the DNA, but able to stitch it together to make the data we need to do genealogy. Are you able to tell us which lab did the work on that? Or is that proprietary knowledge right now? It was Australia Forensics. And yeah, everybody knows about them. Yeah, There's we've a- heard really good stuff about them. Yeah. Yeah, we've had some yes, very good conversations with Ed Green and Kelly Harkins Kincaid from Estrella. And as a matter of fact, mm-hmm. I think my initial contact with them was facilitated by you and David Middleman. You'd both recommended, Bill, if you want to learn mm-hmm. more about how this technology has advanced, these are the people to talk to. So you brought mm-hmm. in Estrella to take a look at the hair that was left from the mask, which had been sitting there for decades. We did it the other way around. Derek had some hair from the police 10 years earlier. He had a collection of hair that he was very carefully coveting and protecting. And so we sent some hair to Estrella and we got a SNP profile, maybe January, February, that we could use for genealogy. How long did it take them to create the profile? I'd say a couple of months. So the turnaround time was quite reasonable given the level of technology and science that goes into it. Yeah, and a lot of it is not only the extraction, but also the bioinformatics to get that data all together into a data set that can be used. You can have those little fragments with snips all over the floor and you got to assemble them into the rug, so to speak. So it takes some thought. The smaller the piece, the harder it is to find out where it fits somewhere in the genome. So it took, I'd say, a couple of months, which was reasonable. They're really good at it. They do well. And were you still calling Um, these samples Summerton Man at at this point? That was the name you were working um, with, right? I'm not sure what we called it. We didn't exactly say, hey, this is a Summerton Man, but we don't want to tell you about it. I forgot what we called it. We We had, oh, we called him Sandy. Well, I called him the because he was okay. found on a beach. <laughs> he was found on the beach. Okay, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> I got it. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> so we always referred to Sandy. We we're working on Sandy today. Sandy nice. McMahon. I think we we called him. I think the original name was Jerry McMahon. I said I didn't like that, so I think we changed it. Sandy McMahon. Like that. <laughs> I like that. That's great. He probably would laugh to hear that. <laughs> So they came well, back you know, to you with a profile. Was that in a format that was allowed you then to begin to do your work on the forensic genetic genealogy side? Yeah, that's a GED match, family tree DNA, uploaded, do the whole nine yards like you think. You've had now, great success. Wait, we're not done yet. No, oh, you're no. totally not. Mm-hmm. And this is fascinating. Keep going. No. Okay, no, it gets more fascinating in a minute because you got to know who he is. The whole forensic genealogy thing is an American phenomenon, and the databases are full of American genealogists. So normally, you do a case outside of, say, U.S. and even Canada, and you run into low matches, you run into... You would see, normally you'd think, the matches, anybody on the list are going to be distant matches because... He's dead in 1948, and maybe he connects to Americans through the UK before they came to the United States or to Australia. You can really understand a very deep connection, but recent, who knows? We got lucky. We got lucky because the top match was a young man who was like on the second cousin level. The rest of them, the rest of them were really low. And they did connect in the UK. There were a lot of Americans that connected to whoever he was a long time ago. This man, his name was Jack. He was maybe 30 years old. And he didn't know who his father was. And the connection was through his father's line to the Somerton man, of course. Uh, I spent a weekend just... And then I, I wrote him. I said, we're doing this John Doe case. I really can't talk a lot about it. You turned out that... If you shared your DNA with us, or you shared your story, or you shared your ancestry account, whatever, it would be very helpful to us to find out who this man is. And we didn't say anything else about it. And because I was American, they didn't really suspect that this was an Australian case. 
Join us again next time on Mind Over Murder as we continue our conversation with forensic genetic genealogist Colleen Fitzpatrick. She will tell us the rest of the story about how she and Derek Abbott, the University of Adelaide professor and the team at Astrea Forensics, solve the mystery of who is the Somerton Man and why has this mystery remained locked since 1948. That's next time on Mind Over Murder. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Mind Over Murder. We'll see you next time. Mind Over Murder is a production of Absolute Zero and Another Dog Productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder. <laughs>